Hi all, uh, Simon Brown here, just one lap as promised. Uh, we've got AGM Tax in the room, I'm with uh, Bobby Vessels. He's going to be giving us a sort of their highlight overview of the 2021 budget from Minister Mbaweni from last week. Uh, there's of course the, the, the tax blog on the justonelap.com website. But we've got Bobby Vessels to tell us what they did see, but also importantly, what we didn't see because often it's what's not there that's important. Uh, he'll do a, a short punt around that, but certainly we've got some time. Uh, if you've got questions, hit us up with your questions. We'll take those as well. But with that, uh, Bobby, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I think for this version of my recap of the budget, I'm going to break it down into the good, the unfortunate, and the silent. Uh, I don't think there's anything particularly bad. I think there's some things that are unfortunate, um, but we probably did see them coming and um, they are what they are at the end of the day. Um, so I think let's start off with the good. I think for a lot of this community, the um, bracket creep, so uh, the so-called bracket creep, we see none there of this year, which is a great, great thing. Most of the um, individual income tax brackets increased by 5% each. So that means that um, if your general income increases by inflation, uh, you won't see a increase in your tax or at least the decrease in your, your disposable income due to, to tax being payable. And that, that's a great thing for a lot of people. Coupled with that, we see two other um, really good reliefs for taxpayers. Firstly, we see that the medical tax credit that has been increased slightly, which means that if you make contributions towards medical aid, depending on the amount of dependence that is on that medical aid, you'll get a certain reduction of your normal tax payable, which is of course a great thing. Coupled with that, our primary, secondary and tertiary rebates also increased um, during, during this budget speech, which for, for the average taxpayer, the, the, the guy on the street, uh, that is really, really uh, good news and, and welcome news and glad to see that government is, is engaging to ensure that after a really tough year that we still put money back in, into the individual's hands. On the, on the corporate side, um, maybe not just yet, but um, in the soon future, we'll see that from starting from March, 2020, uh, April, sorry, 2022, the end of March 2022, we'll see that the corporate income tax um, percentage will be decreased from 28% to 27%. Uh, I think that's welcomed by a lot of people. Um, we've seen that Mr. Mbuweni recognizes that we, there's a need for, for our economy to become more competitive. And we can see that the average sort of corporate income tax rate around the world is at around 23.6 to 23.8%. We're still lingering in the 28 um, in the 28 percent range, but soon, from starting from April next year, we'll see that that gets decreased to 27 percent. Just trying to bring us more competitive into the markets, I think that's a really good thing. Um, I, th I think sort of caveated with that, which is important to just mention, is that it's not just this blanket reduction in the corporate income tax rate. What we actually see along with that, and, and government trying to sort of juxtapose and balance the, the two sides of the scale, is that government's going to, at some other stage, introduce some reform as it relates to assessed losses. Uh, we're not sure exactly what that looks like yet. We, we have kind of an idea that they might play with the percentage of the assessed loss that you're able to use in a specific tax year against the income which you have made. But we're not quite sure what that's going to look like yet. But you can see clearly government saying, yes, we will drop the corporate tax rate on the one end. But on the other end, these assessed losses that you've been claiming, we're going to sort of tighten up on that and uh, not allow you to claim 100% in a single year against your, your income that you have made. Other things that I think are, are quite interesting that has come up is tax residency. We have a lot of um, South Africans that are unfortunately leaving the country. And we see that the government has, has tried to play with the idea of tax residency along with your RA and how that RA is taxed. There's an anomaly that arises in, in some double tax agreements that South Africa has with um, the rest of the world that says that the lump sum withdrawal from your retirement um, funds is essentially taxed in the country in which you are resident. That leaves us with an unfortunate situation, at least as this from South African government perspective, where people leave the country they cease being tax resident in South Africa, but what happens is they only withdraw from that um, retirement fund sometime after ceasing to be resident, and that entire lump sum amount is then potentially taxable only in the country um, in which they have now become resident, not being South Africa. We can see government is saying that, look, you've been claiming these deductions from um, those RAs 
for quite a long period of time and now you're just withdrawing and we, we don't get to see some of that tax and what government is saying is look we will try and um, we're going to say that the day before you cease to be a tax resident we're going to regard you to have effectively pick up the tax on that um, fund that retirement fund of sorts interesting move um, on on government side i think they also recognize that they've recently introduced the three-year rule which says that your uh, retirement funds and that's your pension provident and retirement annuities that you cannot uh, withdraw them uh, if you're in the if you're in an outside country S simply you have to keep those within south africa for three years and after ceasing to be a tax resident for three years you'll be able to pull those those funds across now they recognize that there's some form of anomaly that arises one on the one hand they're saying look we're going to tax you the day before you cease to be a south african tax resident on this ra and on the other hand, they're saying, you can't pull that RA for three years. And um, they recognize that, that this is a potential um, liquidity problem for a lot of individuals. And so they're saying, look, we're going to regard the tax um, on the day before you cease to be a resident, but that, that tax will only become payable. It's going to be a deferral of some sorts once you actually pull those funds um, into the outside of the South African net. So government trying to balance their different policies there. It's at least good to see that from the back government recognizes this. We're not sure how that is going to look yet, but quite a complex little structure um, that government is, is trying to, to fill all the holes with. On to the unfortunate, I think um, a lot of people that have invested in a lot of time and effort in the venture capital scheme, um, it seems like that reg regulation is now going to come to an end. Um, this year, we know that the sunset clauses have been extended a couple of times, but um, from the 30th of June this year, you'll no longer be able to make contributions to a VCC and be able to claim those, uh, the full deduction against your income tax. It is unfortunate. I think there's a lot of um, VCCs that have recently only caught on to this legislation and, and really tried to, on a bona fide basis, sort of make a difference in, in the economy, but simply that scheme does not work for government anymore and they've said that um, come the 30th of June that um, you'll no longer get those lucrative um, deductions against your, your income. Another interesting thing COVID-19 world related we see government is going to go forward with plans to um, look and adjust the legislation around the travel and working from home. Uh, they're going to try and do that on some form of an equitable basis. We're not sure what that's going to look like but government recognizing that quite Honestly, our employment landscape has changed and what we're going to do is, is we need to balance the way we tax people in relation to, to that employment landscape. So we're expecting changes um, at least sometime during the year in, in that regard. What we didn't see, uh, I think two things quite interesting. One, we didn't see a wealth tax and two, we didn't see any increase in um, capital gains tax. The capital gains tax one um, is was for me quite um, obvious. I didn't think that it was going to go get increased since 2001. Um, in October of this year, we'll have had that regime for capital gains tax regime for 20 years. And since 2001 at inception, we've only raised 156 billion Rand um, from, from capital gains tax. If you consider that that includes estates, it includes companies, trusts and individuals, uh, a really insignificant amount of, of tax being raised through, through capital gains and, and government not really looking to tweak that, that regime as yet. From a wealth tax side, um, interestingly, no wealth tax. A lot of people did predict it. Um, our personal views was that it probably wasn't on the cards and that we are just simply, um, our, the tax net just isn't there and that people in South Africa are generally overtaxed. But what we do see is, is government saying, yes, we will not raise the wealth tax, but we recognize that there are wealthy individuals out there with complex structures and that are potentially not towing the line in terms of their tax liability. And we're going to investigate those um, individuals more carefully. And a lot of those individuals can expect to receive some form of notifications from SARS come April this year. So I think overall, the um, slant of the budget is we're not going to look to raise taxes that much. What we're going to look to do is, is we're going to look to focus on the collection. And those that are, are busy evading the, their tax liabilities, those are the ones that we're going to come, come after. I think that's a good move from government. Um, I think those of us that are paying our taxes are just simply um, overburdened at this stage and the focus of government in, in a really good um, position in that regard.
Yeah, that, that's a good point. I like that. I mean, in essence, we're looking at at, at enforcement uh, rather. And and I suppose I mean, my, my media question, and there's a couple I've come through already, is 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 the, then its capacity of SARS. And and I mean, what is the sense? I mean, SARS is certainly better than it was a couple of years ago. Maybe not as good as it was a decade ago. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I think we can see that there's a lot of resources being pushed into SARS to bolster. Um, to bolster the system, about 3 billion rand, I think, has been made available um, under this high net worth individual or to target this high net worth individual. SARS is, are looking to really bolster their um, IT capabilities and their mechanisms of tracking various funds. We see that on the donation stack side, for example, what SARS is doing is they're saying, look, um, we, we recognize that a lot of people are claiming Section 18A deductions. Um, for donations made to public benefit organizations. And we're not sure if those public benefit organizations are actually public benefit organizations. So we're going to be putting in some effort to make sure that uh, Section 18As are, are pre-populated into the, the income tax return, similar to, your, um, similar to what happens with your interest and your IT3Bs and your RP5s, for example. So moves from SARS to try and ramp up that collection, recognizing shortcomings in the own system and, and try to fix that and, and make a a better collection service at the end of the day. The, the, the point around uh, uh, capital gains, and I, I'm always surprised by how little it actually does bring in. I mean, the, the key point, obviously, no change there, which, you know, my one frustration is always with capital gains. If I've held an asset for a decade and it's grown at inflation and no more, I've, I've you know, I'm 60 plus percent up just from inflation return, and then SARS you know, nails me on CGT. They're basically taxing me on, on inflation. And there does seem some lag there. But I mean, if they're not, I mean, is, is it almost a tax, which is, I don't know, it's sort of not, I suppose they're not going to ditch it. But if it's not making money for them, it seems like a, a fair bit of administration. Or is it a simpler tax for them to manage? No, I think it is a fair, fair bit of um, administration, Simon. I think what also happens is, um, there's there's some exemptions and exclusions within the CGT regime that, that does help a help a lot and, and sort of softens the blow on, on individuals particularly. Um, it is a tax that, that does, um, I think, cost a lot of sort of uh, investigation to ascertain what it is or that the person is liable for. I mean, a lot of the times we are faced with just the simple question of, is this asset which you are, which you are holding, one that you are holding for income purposes or one that you're holding for, for capital gains purposes? And simply that distinction in and of itself is, is probably the most litigated matter in, in the tax world. And um, we're confronted with it, I would say, weekly, if not daily, um, is, is this income or capital in nature. I know there's a very famous quote, and the professor or the person that said his name sort of eludes me at this point in time, but he said, capital gains was, uh, the only good that capital gains has done is it allowed accounting students to fail their tax exams. <laughs> I don't know how much truth that holds uh, today, but... Um, potentially, I think, a, a tax that requires a lot of resources from SARS. You, you mentioned that that line in the sand, is it capital, is it, is it income? I mean, is it a case of if I the three-year rule? I mean, is that a rule or is that a, a guidance? Yes, it is a rule, Simon. I think it's often very, um, it's a rule and a guidance, um, if I can say that. I think it's often <laughs> a little bit um, mis conceptualized, I was actually saying to Devet, I think uh, we need to do an article on that for this community, um, because it's something that this community, I see debates on a, on a regular basis. I think what that rule does is, is it recognizes exactly the difficulty that we sit with um, in distinguishing between a capital and income assets. And to say that the average person on uh, your average taxpayer, for them to understand and comprehend that that, um, that distinction is quite difficult. So what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna come and draw a line in the sand that can just help you and, and guide you better in, in that regard. So there where you hold equity shares, for example, and you hold them for longer than three years, we say that, look, if you're holding that, um, that share for three years, then you probably have the intention of holding it as a capital asset. And therefore, um, after three years, we're going to regard that to be um, capital in nature. But, but that doesn't mean that between year one and year three, or year zero and year three, that you don't hold it as a capital asset. It doesn't mean that automatically between um, or, or less than three years that it is now one that must be included on your on your income um, in your income as such, and not on a capital gains basis. The reason being, the common law test still holds. And the common law test is simply, what is the purpose with which you are holding this asset? 
is it for long-term growth or gain, or is it merely just to make a quick buck, um, to put it, um, put it lightly? And um, that test, you have to still apply irrespective of, or, or at least in the instance where you are in the less than three year category. The moment you fall over that, you have legislation that you can fall back on and say, hey, hey um, we're saying that this is, is a capital, capital asset. And that's specifically now for, for equity shares. Great question coming from Peter LaRue, which I think is a fair question after a year of lockdown. He says he's now getting to claim for a home office for his first year, um, for the first time ever, because of course he's been working from home. Can you give us some broad outlines on, on what we can and can't on a, on, a, on a home office? And as I understand, if you own the property, there's CTG implications on the sale. Yeah, so, so two things to, to remember, two sides of the scale, very, very important. Um, there is CGT implications on the sale and you'll need to apportion your primary residence exclusion that you get on the basis of the usage that you you have um, from from the property so if you're using the property for purposes of trade then um, there's going to be some form of apportionment on your cdt basis at the end and the entire capital gain may or may not be excluded under your um, primary residence exclusion for example the other thing to to remember just sort of when can I claim a, an office expenditure? And I think where a lot of people go wrong is the in order to claim um, an office expenditure, it needs to be a room in your home that is specifically dedicated for working from home purposes. It can't just be, um, I have a big sitting room and I've plonked a table there now because I've been in lockdown for, um, for three months and now I'm plonking this, this table there and this is now my office and my sitting, you know, my sitting room is the largest portion of my house, so I'm going to claim 50% of, um, of my expenses there. That, that is not how it works. The room needs to be specifically dedicated for your um, home office usage, and you must be able to work from home more than 50% of, of your time. Yeah, I, I take, okay, okay, so it is 50% of, of, of the time. And then in essence, if that room happens to be 11%, I can claim back the pro rata on the costs of the, the upkeep of the property. I mean, that goes as far as cleaning services and, and insurance and the like. Um, look, Simon, um, it is, it is the, the debated much. Uh, I think there are some people that push things through that potentially <laughs> are, that you're, you're floating close to the edge. The question is, is, you know, for example, if it is cleaning services to clean your garden, I, I, I can't see Not. how that at okay. all, um, yeah, yeah. At all all helps you. Look, uh, and maybe just sticking to what I said earlier, we, we are going to see uh, moves in this re uh, regulation soon. Mm -hmm. um, it has never been a problem pre-COVID because I think quite a small portion of people actually made use of it. We, we've now just seen an increase and in, an in uptake in it, and um, we're going to see regulations on it. Potential relaxation, potential tightening, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I think at this point in time, um, we may see government relax some of these uh, requirements, but um, we've got to wait and see. Yeah, and, and I take your point. This needs to be an office. This can't just be your dining room table. That, that, that's not how it's going to roll. Question from Candice, and, and this might be a little too far beyond the scope of, of, of this presentation, but she says, uh, how does an SA minor beneficiary of an offshore trust get taxed on dividends paid to the trust? Because this um, is... <laughs> Yeah, it's a little bit outside um, outside this conversation, but I think important to to always consider is if if that distribution is actually then made to the miner at the end of the day. That's the first question you're going to ask yourself: is there is that dividends being declared to an offshore trust, and then it's just sitting there in the trust, and the trust is, is holding it, irrespective mm -hmm. of the fact that this child is a beneficiary of the trust. The trust actually needs to declare it um, mm. to to that um, to that child. the The thing is, um, often the foreign dividends exemption, people mis mistake this a little bit, because that child doesn't actually hold the shares in that company, the foreign dividends exemption, or at least the participation exemption, which says that we hold more than 10% shares in a foreign company, the foreign dividends is exempt for income tax purposes. That's not the case in this example, because um, the trust is actually the one that, that holds the shares in, in the company. And there's a lot of anti-avoidance regulations that's typically being brought up about in respect of, of trusts and where they hold shares and companies and the foreign dividends being declared and section 25b has been tightened uh, exceptionally over the last couple of years to avoid those types of anomalies creeping through typically when you have foreign trusts and um, companies and foreign companies outside the south african net 
my my advice is always put all the facts on the table and let's look at the entire picture yeah. and take it from take it from there. It's it's sometimes difficult to give you a shot out the hip answer um, without knowing exactly all the all the facts um, that's that's on the yeah, table. In jurisdictions and the like. But in essence, to your point, you've got a trust, you've got a minor separate entities in many senses. Uh, to section twelve J. Uh, the 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 the, the, the it, it, it was sort of sunsetting in June hasn't been extended. I've had a lot of people say to me, "What about my investment in 12J? If it's in, it's in." Is that is my understanding? It's new investments post June. Well, you won't be able to do them post June. Look, I think what um, I saw an, an interesting post on, on LinkedIn the other day, and I thought it, it actually balances the equation a little bit. Um, and, and maybe this is something you and Christia, I think, are definitely better positioned to, to speak about than myself. But my feeling on, on 12J has always been um, the tax deduction aside, you, it is an investment at the end of the day. And you need to invest in an investment that you think is going to work for you and that's going to create the sustainable benefits for whichever plan you are working with, be it long term, short term, or in the medium, medium term. Um, and to have invested in a 12J purely on the back end of a tax deduction. Potentially not such a good idea, I don't think. I think um, your commercial motives should tr- drive your investment first and thereafter look at your um, at the tax tax deductions. So what I'm actually trying to get out of a long-winded thing, sorry, I had to get that off my chest because it has, has <laughs> been bugging me, this idea of just investing in 12 days because I get a tax deduction. Um, but a, a long-winded thing is these schemes or, or 12 J's are going to continue to exist. They're investment vehicles. Um, they give shares. They may change their landscape um, come post the, the 30 June, but essentially those companies are still going to exist and the likelihood of you investing in them may always still also exist depending on how those companies themselves feel. The only thing that you're going to be losing is you're not getting that tax deduction at the end of the day. So if these companies are still welcoming in, investors in and you think it's a good investment that's going to give you substantial returns or the returns that you'd like to see, then you can still invest in them and they will continue to exist. Um, it's just simply the thing that's going to fall away is your tax deduction. If you're in, you're in, you've gotten your, your tax deduction. And um, if you invest before 30 June, you'll also still get your, your tax deduction. How the exiting rules are going to work now and what government's going to do there remains to be seen, if, if, if at all. But um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, and I take your point. I, mean, I think they were, and that was one of the objections from government. And I know a lot of people have said it. It, it had become a tax scheme rather than a a uh, 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 sort of a, a benefit uh, uh, businesses and, and, and the like. Um, a question I know that hasn't come through, but everyone's asking uh, uh, the, the, the tax free component stayed at 36,000. Mm-hmm. No change to that. Also stayed at half a million lifetime limit. Uh, no change to that. But the lifetime limit is, is, is many, many years away. Uh, so that really isn't a, a concern for us right now. Uh, just checking if anything else has come through. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm getting feedback on the other side. I need to, uh, too, too many, too many coming through. I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, I think we will park it there. Uh, Bobby, really appreciate I mean, my senses. I mean, actually, as, as, as South Africans, we actually, you know, as taxpayers, I was on the right budget. You know, my, my, my brackets increase. Uh, that helps me uh, broadly. It was a good, a good budget. Oddly enough, a question coming through on Twitter as I sit on Facebook, but whatever. Um, that, back to the three-year rule. And I know you clarified it in your intro. Maybe the person missed it. There's been some changes to, to retirements in terms of immunizations, et cetera. But that new rule is if you are immigrating, you now need to take into account that government is saying there's a three-year wait for you to cash that pension. And that, that's the short version of it. And you need to build that into, you know, if you're immigrating at age 30, not a problem. Age 70, maybe uh, uh, some issues. Look, um, so I'm in debate myself. I've, I've done quite a number of, of, of these um, consultations with individuals, I think over the last, say, six, five, six months. Very unfortunate for those um, who have been wanting to immigrate and are towards that, you know, close to that 70 um, year bracket as you as you were saying because potentially they've built in for themselves that they would need some of these funds to relocate or they needed to start their new life um, overseas and maybe their kids are there and that's why why they're going it's not all sour grapes it's not all just I'm leaving South Africa there are some people that genuinely have good motives mm. for, for leaving um, just like you would in, in any country and um, so I think it's unfortunate for, for those people but you can clearly see what government is, is trying to, to get at. And 
I, I take it um, the fact that we've seen this introduction by government saying, look, we realize that we, we want to recover some of this tax money, but we also realize that we've implemented rules that require you to keep the funds in your three years. We're not going to tax you before you've actually received those funds. From my side, I, I think a good move from government and not the foresight at least to, to acknowledge that from the outset is, is rewarding. Cool. We'll leave that there. I'm not seeing um, I'm missing questions. Nope, questions in in, in got them. Uh, but we appreciate the time. I mean, in closing, as I was saying a moment ago, I mean, the, the, the sense is we have a good national treasury. We got a decent budget. Uh, now it's down to SARS to go and, and, and fetch that money from the individuals. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, in, in conclusion, maybe a, a couple of, of comments. Um, you, you said for, for the average person on the street, your average taxpayer, a really good budget, I think. Um, for, for someone like yourself and Christia that enjoy a bit of bubbles every now and then, that 8% <laughs> increase in, in the, the excise tax uh, might hit you a little bit, uh, but I think it's one that, considering all the other benefits that you're getting, hopefully you're, you're yeah. willing to forego. I will pay it. Um, <laughs> I think um, two things that are, that are important from this budget, and I know you've mentioned it yourself, is it's a really good budget on paper. Um, we need to really see Treasury implement this and along with SARS. There's a massive obligation on SARS here to ensure that taxes which aren't being collected will be collected within, within the next year. And um, so I expect SARS to really come out the gates um, firing in that regard and sort of live up to their mandate. It, that is their, their obligation. Yeah. Um, and the yeah. burden does, does fall on them. So I, I expect some massive moves from SARS. And we've seen that since... Um, Commissioner Kieswerk has taken taken over. There, there has been a lot of urgency on, on SARS's side. I would hope that the urgency would be balanced with focusing on the right areas and um, sort of making sure that they are targeting the low-hanging fruits first. I think that would, would be a prudent approach from, from SARS's perspective. Overall, a really good budget. We now need to see it implemented. Uh, there's a lot of good being sort of foresighted and being visioned. Uh, I, I have a lot of trust in... in Minister Mbuweni at least, and um, I think it's now going to be up to how well is Treasury and SARS going to be able to implement what they've put forward on the table. The last question that came in from Brendan, he's talking about uh, offshore unit trusts. I mean, unit trust domiciled in, for example, the US uh, and taxation on, on, on the dividends. Those are just going to be dividends out of the mutual fund and would be taxed as per normal dividends. You, of course, wouldn't own more than 2%, it's not a company, sorry, 10%, it's not a company, it's just gonna be your sort of normal foreign dividend coming into South Africa. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Usually um, you see that those those funds are also generally, if you're worried about those kind of things, those funds are all, all generally quite good at, at managing that um, anyway. And so uh, to people, I think people are typically get quite worried about whether what they should do and how they should, should treat, the, treat this, the tax there. But um, often those funds and companies are really good at making sure that your portion of the pie gets gets paid over and that you're, you're stuck with, with the residual amount that um, is owed to you. So I wouldn't be yeah. too fake. Wouldn't stress it. Uh, Bobby Vessels, AGM Tax uh, to your team. Really appreciate uh, what you've put, uh, the, 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 the work since budget. I know Wednesday was a crazy day. Uh, really appreciate your insights today. Uh, everyone stay safe. Uh, have a good day further. Bobby, thanks very much. Cheers all. Thanks a lot, Simon. Keep well. Cool. We are offline.